you want to not remove all the bacterial flora of your hand you want to minimize it you have no bacterial flora of your hand but you minimize it these days recently dr drod pare was in bombay and i sent my one patient to offer him to operate and what he did he came in the operation theater he had some jelly and he jelly he put his jelly here like this thing and put on the gloves now that jelly also brings down the bacterial flora to a desired effect that's extremely important scrubbing i'm sure you all know how to do it if you don't do the scrubbing you are causing a problem now from a red zone when you go inside the operation theater it is called as a black zone now the black zone is the one where the operating team is inside that black zone so that now you cannot go out and nobody can come in your scrub nurse your everything circulating nurse is outside you want something from that you can ask for that thing and she will give it to you extremely important you see there is a gentleman who is standing in a properly put on a cap proper mask and you see the shirt shirt is tucked inside never you have your shirt outside your pajama should have an elastic at the down or preferably put on a gum boots why so why can you anybody answer it why you want this thing very simple answer very simple answer it is your staphylococcus epidermidis on the body your bacterial flora on your skin all the time you are shedding bacteria from your body and they are falling down and as they fall down they increase the bacterial count of your operation theater therefore if you have the shirt tucked in and if you are putting on the any gown all the bacteria flora you are shedding will probably not go so much into the air and your bacterial count will low down very small things to do it but you find everybody having a khula pajama having a shirt outside mask up to this place topi yahan ki hai all eyebrows open big hair i don't allow in my operation theater if you come in my operation theater you will see what the ot discipline means i am very very strict on what on this issue now the hand washing if you know these days has become a fashion of today which was started in late 19th century now every day it is become compulsory and mandatory that every place there you should be doing a hand washing all source of infection is through this thing you have different uh, uh, alcohol and iodine preparation and propanol and sevlon etc so many preparations are available of course you know about the joseph lister who is considered to be a father of antiseptic who started with the carbolization used to have a carbolic acid spray in the operation you know the first person to talk about there is a something called as an antiseptic there was a time when there was no anesthesia there was no gloves the surgeon will come in a long tail coat and will do the operation quickly and he will take a prize see i have done this operation in 2 minutes time do you know what is the record of a mortality in because of the operation world record 300% 300% the surgeon there was a observer who came from outside to see one surgeon operating that he was operating very fast so assistant was assisting him one person was seeing the operation the surgeon took the knife you know those amputation knife Shh, we used to do that and he said look i am going to do the operation patient without anesthesia three person holding the leg Shh, the moment he did it he cut the finger of his assistant who got septicemia and died the person who was observing this thing the tail of his coat was cut because of that knife he got a shock he died and the patient of course died so this is a 300% mortality during those time 
A hip disarticulation has been done in seven minutes, my dear boys. In seven minutes, the hip disarticulation has been done. This is the world record. Know it about it. Boiling sterilization. These days, you don't do much with the boiling because you have got a far better. These days, the 90% sterilization is done by autoclave in which there is a high pressure. And because of the high pressure, and they, you have got the, uh, the uh, indicators which tell you that your thing has been sterilized or not, and you can do this thing. Of course, these days, all operation theaters have got an ethylene uh, ETO by which you can do a lot of sterilization of these things. And of course, you know the Cydex, which is used and this, uh, where you can use the formalin tablets for making a quick, this thing. And this is how you do a fumigation, where you use a KMNO4, and you can use within a formalin and leave it for 24 hours for doing these things. Lot of operation theaters have an ultraviolet. Now, when you are using an ultraviolet, you operation theater should have a red light. Moment you put on the ultraviolet rays, the red light should be on, it is usually left open on overnight and not in the daytime. So when you are operating, you don't operate with the ultraviolet rays. These all things this thing. These days the new machines, the fogger machines have come for these things. Laminar airflow. How many of you are familiar with laminar airflow? Raise your hand. Okay. Now what is a laminar airflow? This system came in the medical practice from the Air Force industry, from the Air Force. In the laminar airflow, you see the idea is that you, if you have the air, we should come in the operation theater. If it is filtered, and then the same air is sucked in, and again it is filtered, and again it comes in the operation theater, again it is sucked in, like this, this circulation goes on. Why it is called a laminar airflow? Because there is an a cooling of the air and then there are HEPA filters. HEPA filters are called as H for high, E for efficient, P for particulate air. So high efficient particulate air, they are called as HEPA filters. Most of the organism, bacteria, are more than five micron size. The size of a bacteria is more than five micron. One micron is equal to what? One micron is equal to 25,000 part of an inch. You can see that. So if you have a filter by which the air is going and it will stop those things, anything which is bigger than five micron, but we allow the air with those particles which are less than three micron, then you are getting almost a clean air inside. So it will, you will have an air which will almost be free of bacteria and such air circulation should be about 20 times in one hour. Laminar airflow is asked in your examination as a short notes. Most of the op good operation theaters have this laminar airflow system and with the HEPA filter which should be changed every six months and you can thereby reduce the infection. There is a very big Indian Council of Medical Research study done in India. Whether a laminar airflow is important or not, you will be surprised to know, in a controlled study they found that it is not very essential. If you have a good operation theater discipline, a good fumigation, a regular bacterial culture, you can have the same much infection rate. Professor Bhargav was a very eminent surgeon in Patna Medical College. In those days, his infection rate was about 2 to 3 percent, and that was a pre-antibiotic era. When there was no antibiotic, no laminar airflow, only thing there was at that time an OT discipline and your surgical technique. You have to be very gentle with the patient. <coughs> These are the filters 
different types of filters which are available. Lot of patients these days are coming with HIV positive and uh, hepatitis B. You have to take a very special precautions, what is called as the universal precautions. And you see this patient is wearing a, a plastic apron. When you scrub up, you should always wear a plastic apron. And when you are going and putting on a sterilized gown, between the sterilized gown and between your shirt and pajama, there should be a, preferably a sterilized plastic apron. Why? Very simple reason. Because you are shedding the bacteria from your body. The clothes are, will allow these bacteria to come out and these bacteria will go into the operating area. Therefore, you want to have a barrier which will not allow you these bacteria to go into the operational theatre. Very small thing to do. In our operation theatre, <coughs> nobody operates unless until you have got a plastic barrier between the gown and your shirt. These small things. This, now you just try to see these few photographs which will show that why infection takes place. This gentleman has no cover at the back, his mask is not properly, his pajama is too loose, sometimes those syringes may be reused, you can see the dirt in the operation theatre, and these are the, all the sources of infection in the operation theatre. By just simply taking a look into this OT discipline, you get a lot of things you can save. If you have a regular carbonization, regular fumigation, regular bacterial count done in this thing, operation theater. You are meticulous with surgery. You have made sure your hemostasis has been done. Made sure that you have done the minimum use of the cautery. Made sure that you have given a preoperative antibiotic. You have made sure that you have not done the shaving 24 hours before, but just half an hour before that. And that, the, you have taken care of everything, rest assured, you will not get any surgical site infection, which is very important. So what we do it, we try to delay our diagnosis <coughs> of any complication. We try to avoid and try not to accept our mistake. Leave aside treating this patient like this ostrich does it, and they think that everything is going on fine. But please remember that for that patient, it is 100%. If he gets one complication, it is a hundred percent. Every day, probably you do not know, there has been a reward of 1.5 crore rupees against one orthopedic surgeon in this country. I don't know whether you know about it. 1.5 crore. Because the first surgeon did not take one simple precaution which he should have taken. And that officer on which he had operated is a senior police officer. He went to the court of law, he won the case, and got it 1.5 crore rupees for this thing. And a lot of harassment, and a lot of things which come in the media and the press these days. Therefore, I always say, the prevention is any day far better than the cure. Take precautions, very small things, but you can implement in your life, and your life will be much pleasant to look after with these things. These are some of the, you can see these wounds, how they look like. Biomedical waste management is extremely important. And this is our staff who works hard day and out. Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation India has been conducting a OT technician courses all over the country. We have done now about 25 courses. We have written a book on this thing, and the book has been written in all the languages of the country, and we go everywhere to conduct this two days course. Sherwani is here. Sherwani, we did one course at his place. It's a very good course on these things, and because, because we feel that every patient deserves the best. He has come to you with a lot of faith, a lot of confidence. He considers you to be a god and prove it that you are a god to him. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Taneja, for stressing the need of OT discipline amongst the younger students.
मे आई ना रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर शेरवानी टू काइंडली कम एंड गिव इज टॉपिक ऑन बोन ट्यूमर्स विच विल इंक्लूड बिनाइन वर्सेज मेलेग्नेंट डायग्नोसिस एंड वैल्यूएशन एंड सिंपल बोन सिस्ट वर्सेज एनिमल बोन सिस्ट वर्सेज जाइन सेल ट्यूमर डॉक्टर शेरवानी प्लीज Presence of this conference to have given me the opportunity to speak and certainly when I speak, I am speaking after Professor Taneja. Uh, it's very difficult, you know. I have learned a lot from Professor Taneja, and today also I have learned a lot on OT discipline. My first lecture is on benign versus malignant tumors, differential diagnosis and evaluation. And when we talk of bone tumors, I think this man should be remembered because his contributions are numerous. An American pathologist and just a very quick reminder of a few syndromes that he described. And they go after his name and the name of the co-workers. And now I come on the main subject. The subject of bone tumors is really confused. Why? Because the pathologist the radiologists and the clinicians, they never seem to agree. There is always debate and there is always discussion. My wife, Professor Rana Sherwani, is a pathologist. She's sitting here. Sometimes we quarrel even at home. <laughs> That's a fact. When it comes to the clinical features and evaluation, you know, tumor would always present with a mass and musculoskeletal pain. What is the goal? The goal is prompt diagnosis because an early efficient treatment. Because the delay in diagnosis is likely to worsen the prognosis and perhaps a lost chance for limb salvage surgery. And of course, the secondary goal is spare the patient with benign disease, the risk, the discomfort, and expense of extensive evaluation, and the tension to the patient and the whole family. So really, prompt diagnosis is necessary because not only in malignant, but also in benign, because we have to reduce the tension of the bone tumor. Of course, you have to take a meticulous history. Age would have the bearing. All of you know, bone tumors, they follow a pattern when it comes to age. They follow a pattern when it comes to location. And whether the mass appeared first or the pain started first, all these things have a bearing how the tumor progressed and is the pain due to the pressure symptoms which is there in benign lesions as well and whether a pathological fracture is there or not because pathological fractures will also lead to pain. So medical history taking is an art and you have to spend time and if you really want to make sure you have to listen to the patient. And of course, after the history comes the examination, local temperature, shape and size, surface and margin, consistency, whether it is fixed or not. The features of a malignant tumor are rapid increase in size, variable consistency, ill-defined margins, and it would be fixed to the skin and the underlying tissues, and the fixed lymph nodes may be there. Now then, two neoplasms of bone have got to be differentiated from hematomas and reactive bone lesions. All of you know, hematomas 
are really group of lesions with an abnormal proliferation of cells which soon mature and stop proliferating. They are really benign growth disorders. These are some examples. Osteochondroma, you can see a pathological fracture in this pedunculated variety. And osteomas, these are all hematomas. And the reactive bone lesions. Patient may be referred to you as an expert because somebody thought that it is a tumor. This may simulate neoplasia even histologically. This is the bony island of no clinical relevance, significance. And this is a myositis mass in the middle in a head injured patient. And I stress fracture at the metatarsa. All these may confuse the doctors at the periphery and even sometimes uh, you also. And then non-neoplastic disorders are there, tumor-like lesions, clinically may simulate tumors, and these are some of the examples, simple bone cyst, aneurysmal, fibrous cortical defect, brown tumor of hyperparathyroidism. So if we quickly classify true bone tumors, you know, all the tumors, they arise from the cells of mesenchymal origin. They have common ancestry, and functionally, their function is a skeletal bone formation. Four main groups are there, depending upon the predominant cells, and metaplasia is common. There could be fibroblasts, there could be chondroblasts, there could be osteoblasts, and they can change from one type to another type. Then there could be tumors arising from tissues normally in the bone, but they are not participating in the bone formation. And tumors arising from the included tissues in the bone, such as chordomas and adamantinomas. And then, of course, a whole group of metastatic bone tumors from different carcinomas of the breast, of the prostate, thyroid, kidney, lung, adrenals, and melanomata, carcinoid tumor, testicular, ovarian. Now, coming to the true bone tumors. Well, this is a quick classification depending upon the predominant cell type. When the predominant cell is an osteoblast, and if it is a benign lesion, then it, we call it osteoma, osteoblastoma, benign osteoblastoma. They are all benign tumors or disorders. And when they are malignant, of course, you know, osteosarcoma. The primary one that occurs in children is the commonest uh, malignant bone tumor. And then there are secondary osteosarcomas following a pre-existing condition, such as Paget's disease, parosteal osteosarcoma, which is a slow-growing osteosarcoma. When the predominant cell is a chondroblast, uh, then benign chondromas and the malignant equivalent are chondrosarcomas. They again are primary and secondary. When it is fibroblast, then of course benign are fibromas. Some people think that solitary bone cyst is also, but there is a debate on that. Non-osteogenic fibroma and the malignant equivalent are desmoid sarcomas. And then initially people thought that osteoclasts are also in the bone. Well, they really probably arise from the coalescence of stromal cells which in turn arise from the non-bone forming supporting connective tissues. Osteoclastoma, all of you know, aneurysmal bone cysts, adamantinomas, chordomas, and then among the osteoclastoma, about 3 to 6 percent are malignant osteoclastomas. I told you that age is very important, there is a predilection between birth and five years, eosinophilic granulomas and unicameral or simple bone cysts, they occur. Between 6 and 18, 
This is the group which is there. Unicameral bone cyst, aneurysmal bone cyst, non-ossifying fibroma, and so on and so forth. Between 19 and 40, the giant cell tumor and eosinophilic granulomas, they occur late also. And this photograph is showing, diagram is showing, the anatomical location and the tumor. In the cortex, you can see the cortical fibrous adamantinoma. Cortical fibrous dysplasia and adamantinoma, they occur in the cortex. Inside is the round cell lesions, U-wings, reticulum cell, myelomas, and then of course is fibrous dysplasia with the typical radiological appearance. Osteoros tumors also occur almost at the cortex. Giant cell tumor, epiphysio-metaphysial there. Then metaphysial is here, osteochondromas, enchondromas. So really, depending upon the area, upon the anatomical location, they could be epiphysial, epiphysio-metaphysial, metaphysial tumors, and diaphysial tumors. Epiphysial, of course, all of you know, epiphysio-metaphysial, the giant cell tumor, and the metaphysial, benign, all these tumors, diaphysial, fibrous dysplasia, adamantinomas. Now, after the careful history taking and examination and the radiology, which we are very used to, certain blood investigation, they do help in making the judgment whether a particular tumor is benign or malignant. For example, multiple myeloma would show gamma globulins in serum electrophoresis. There would be an M band. ESR would be in the tune of 100, around 100, above 70 certainly. Prostate specific antigen for secondaries from carcinoma prostate. Serum acid phosphatase is raised in prostate carcinoma as well as in almost 60% cases of GCT, giant cell tumor. Alkaline phosphatase, wherever there would be bone turnover, such as in osteosarcoma, metastasis, and in some cases of multiple myeloma where there is a pathological fracture. Otherwise, it would be normal. Alkaline phosphatase would be raised. In the urine, of course, Benz Jones proteins, but not always present in multiple myeloma. Now, when we are looking at the X-rays, really the site of the lesion we have discussed, epiphysial lesions, chondroblastoma, I have shown you the diagram, I have shown you the X-ray picture, occurs between 10 and 25 years before the closure of the epiphysis. It is a younger sister of giant cell tumor in children, if you like. GCT between 20 and 40, you have to look for the borders and zones of transition. Matrix in metaphysial lesions, osteosarcoma in the second decade of life, chondrosarcoma in fourth and fifth decade, and diaphysial lesions, of course, Ewing sarcoma, lymphomas, adamantinomas, and histocytosis. Now let us consider the borders of the tumor. A well-defined border, narrow transitional area, and a reactive sclerosis must be a benign lesion. You see? as if the lesion is trapped by peripheral sclerosis. Well-defined border is there, narrow zone of transition. We know where the abnormal is and where the normal is. There is no doubt about it. But when the borders are poorly defined, such as here, 
things are not clear, poorly defined margins, maybe it is inside the canal as well. When this confusion is there, it must be a malignant lesion. Well, GCT, narrow zone of transition, is a malignant, locally malignant lesion, but distant metastasis occurs rarely, 1 to 3 percent of the cases. Narrow zone of transition from abnormal to normal. Anybody would say that up to here is abnormal, then is normal. And compare that with the next radiology, wide zone of transition, from abnormal to normal bone, if you look at this, in the canal also there is up to there, maybe beyond also. So wide zone of transition is a feature of malignancy. Then the matrix of the newborn formation, fluffy cotton-like or cloud-like densities. Look at this picture, fluffy. Within the medullary cavity and in the adjacent soft tissues is a feature of osteoblastic activity. And over there, a popcorn-like, look at that, just like popcorn, punctate, annular or comma-shaped calcification. It's a chondroblastoma or maybe seen specks of calcification in chondrosarcoma as well. Then the destruction has a clear cut telltale pattern on plain x rays, geographic involvement, uniformly destroyed areas with sharply defined borders. Look at that. Must be a GCT. Then moth eaten appearance, likely to be malignant, areas of destruction with ragged borders. <coughs> Something in between, benign and malignant, adamant, you know. Then permeative appearance, ill-defined areas, spreading through the marrow space, large zone of destruction. <coughs> in multiple myeloma, for example. <coughs> then periosteal reaction, sunburst appearance, osteosarcoma. Codman's triangle, look at that. Due to periosteal uplift and newborn formation. And the lamellar picture on in layers and layers of newborn formation as occurs in Ewing's sarcoma. <coughs> Cortical erosion and expansion and penetration, a feature of malignancy. Bony cortex as such is a barrier to growth of tumor. Slow growing lesions would have some scalloping effect and osteal margin and outer cortex will remain intact, would not break down. <coughs> On the other hand, more aggressive bone lesions would penetrate entire cortical thickness and periosteal elevation and different patterns of periosteal newborn formation, as in osteosarcoma. MRI gives you a lot of information about malignant lesions particularly. Neurovascular bundle involvement can be assessed on MRI apart from the bony lesion, delineates soft tissue involvement and muscular compartments. Extent of intramedullary spread. On the X-ray, there might be confusion up to where. But on MRI, they would tell you so many centimeters from the distal end. <coughs> MRI also tells you about the skip lesions in the bone. CT scan is very helpful, particularly to assess the secondaries in the chest. Relationship of periosteal or parosteal tumors with the underlying cortex can be assessed on CT scan and anatomical localization of the lesion. CT guided biopsy can be done with a mo little more perfection. 
I will show you this visualization of nidus in an ostoma on a CT. Look at that. Beautifully shown on transverse as well as the vertical pictures. Then, of course, the bone scan, technetium 99, detection of skeletal metastasis on the bone scan, detection of multiple lesions and skip lesions. I mean, uh, the older generation would agree that we used to do a lot of skeletal survey by repeat x-rays of multiple parts of the body to find out the skip lesions. Nowadays, you give the dye, the leukocytes get labeled, and then you do blood pool pictures after half an hour, one hour by the gamma camera, and you know where the skip lesions are. I will show you, this is the plain x-ray, there is something wrong there, but look at that, bone scan has shown it very clearly, and the CT has also shown it more clearly. This must be an osteoadostoma. Well, biopsy is the ultimate, you know, that is sort of histopathology or even cytology, is considered the supreme court of surgery. You know, it is decided there what the lesion is. Fine needle aspiration, use the needle 23 gauge or maximum 22 gauge. No thick bone needle, please. Closed core biopsy can be done, but of course, ultimately, many times you will have to perform open or incisional biopsy and at times for benign lesions, excisional biopsy. Incisional biopsy, you have to follow certain principles. Biopsy incision should be well planned, should be longitudinal. You should be able to excise at the time of definitive surgery. Biopsy should be done at the center where definitive surgery can be performed. It's no good doing the biopsy at the smaller centers and then referring the patient. Minimum dissection should be carried out and should not violate only, should violate only one compartment, should not enter other compartments and should be taken from the peripheral area where there is a junction of normal and abnormal. Gross examination of course would tell you whether it is fibrous dysplasia, well circumscribed intramedullary and very gritty bone and osteosarcoma would show a tan white tumor cell. Most of the medullary cavity would be involved and periosteum would be lifted and of course the micro microscopy only the experts would tell you what it is and these days immunohistochemistry we are having at our institutions, and it is there in so many other institutions. Antigens contained in the cells can be detected by specific antibodies. Antibodies. These antigens are more or less specific of a given cell type and hence of a given tumor. So there are different types. Of course, I'm no expert on that. Just to sensitize you about the immunohistochemistry, this slide was kept. Anyway, the take-home message of benign versus malignant is that meticulous history taking and examination and specific investigations would lead to, to early and accurate diagnosis, which is absolutely important. It is important to differentiate between benign and malignant lesions because prognosis is certainly different. Prompt diagnosis and treatment would lead to better outcome and prevent patients and families' hassles. Thank you very much for the... This was the first part and the second part is the differentiation between simple bone cysts 